Hi, class. Um, today, I am going to be going over how to make up and how to run infrared spectrum. We found last week that these how-to videos actually really helped, and they considerably shortened the time that students were in lab. Um, <clears throat> once again, you will notice when I'm doing this demonstration that I am wearing proper lab attire, and I would again remind you to come to lab properly attired and not to be eating or drinking in lab. Um, this is very important um, for your own safety. This week's compounds are going to be unknowns, and you have to be particularly careful with unknowns, and you have to treat them as though they're extremely toxic compounds. Remember, everything has a toxicity, even water. If you drink too much water, you drown. So everything is toxic. So treat these chemicals as unknowns, okay? You're going to get an unknown solid mixture that you're going to have to separate. When you separate it, one of the things we're going to do, in addition to getting a mass, in addition to melting point, is we are going to measure the infrared spectrum. In class this week, I'm going to be discussing infrared theory. Very basically, infrared spectroscopy involves taking a compound, preparing it in a special way, and passing a series of infrared wavelengths through the sample and measuring which frequencies are absorbed and the um, intensity of the absorptions. The understanding of this information leads you to information about the molecule on a molecular level. Specifically, you will be learning about bonds, the strength of bonds, the types of bonds. Bonds vibrate at the same frequencies as the infrared spectrum. Infrared radiation is relatively low energy radiation and it is very safe to work with, okay? Um, much lower, for example, than ultraviolet or UV. First thing I want to show you is our instrument. Um, <clears throat> this is a Perkin Elmer Paragon 1000 FDIR. We have two of these. Um, they are very good, very valuable instruments, and you will use them on a nearly weekly basis. One thing I want to alert you to right away is that the instructions for using the instrument are taped right on the instrument, but a lot of times people do not are not aware of this for some reason. But you might want to take note of that when you come in lab. We are always willing to help. You know that. Always. But it's good, you know, for your, you know, making dinner time, it's good to get out a little earlier. All right, now, the instruments are always run open, and there's a reason for that I'm going to explain later. This is the area where the beam of infrared radiation comes out, past the sample sits here, and it passes into a detector that's on the other side. This is a computer screen. This is the keyboard for the computer. And over here we just have a very basic uh, printer. We do not print in the NMR room. We print right here. We have two of these. There's one on each side of the room. Now, I'm going to show you how to make three different samples in probably three to four different films because it takes a little bit of time. The first type of sample I'm going to show you how to make is how to make a solid film. And you will be making solid films this week. It's the easiest way to make an NMR sample. Okay? So, what you're going to need to make a solid film is a sodium chloride disc. You will be able to find all IR equipment in these desiccators that are sitting on each side of the instrument. To open a desiccator, all you have to do is slide back the lid. You have to be careful, though, because they're very, you know, if you drop it, it's a very expensive piece. Um, there's drying agent in here, and the atmosphere in there is desiccated. It's very low water. Why? These are sodium chloride discs. That means they're made out of sodium chloride that was pressed at very high pressure. Okay, so if you took very dry sodium chloride, and press it at high pressure, you would get a window that almost looked like glass. This one's no longer perfect. Um, this one may be a little more perfect. But what happens to them over time is they get etched a little bit. The problem is they're water soluble as you would expect sodium chloride to be. So realize you can never wash an NaCl plate with water. You have to wash them with organic solvent. And realize that as samples are put on that have little bits of water in them, 
or compounds that dissolve the salt a little bit, the salt gets etched. That's okay, they still work. Why do we use sodium chloride? We use sodium chloride because sodium chloride is um, invisible to the infrared spectrum. In other words, it doesn't absorb infrared wavelengths. Okay, I'm going to make up the sample now and then run it. To make up the sample, what you need to do is have some small container. Now you folks could even use your watch glass. And with this very large class, I would recommend it. But I'm going to be using an agate uh, pestle, okay? We have an agate, we have several agate mortar and pestles, which are very small, very smooth mortar and pestles. I'm going to take a pinch of a compound. It's transdynamic acid. A pinch. What do I mean by a pinch? Here I'm being like a cook. A lot of times chemists don't measure things out, okay? You have to accept that fact. I'm taking a little spatula tip of the compound. I'm putting it in the agate mortar, I mean pestle. I always get the two mixed up. And I'm going to add a little bit of dichloromethane, our universal solvent. And I mean a little bit. What is a little bit? I'm going to put about a milliliter in there. Now, if you're not good at measuring things out, if you're not good at estimating, just put 10 drops. Um, 10 drops is about a half a milliliter. That should probably be enough. Okay, what am I going to do? The simplest way to make a solid sample, and you're going to have solids next week, is to take a drop of this solution up in a pipette and drizzle it over the top of the sodium chloride plate. Okay? Now, in doing that, the compound is going to get deposited as the dichloromethane evaporates off. The solid will be left as a residue. It's kind of like the way you isolated clove oil a couple weeks ago. Now, while that's drying, because it's going to take about 20 seconds to dry, I'm going to show you how to run the instrument. Okay, this is the instrument. To run an IR, you have to run a background. Okay, to run a background, you have to go, you have to click, you have to type scan, background, execute. It's written on this paper. Okay, what is a background? A background is a spectrum of the air. I'm going to do it now. I'm going to hit scan, okay? I'm going to hit background, and then I'm going to hit execute, okay? I'll tell you right now, that didn't go perfectly, so I'm going to do it again. It did run the background, and I'm going to do it one more time. The instrument isn't warmed up, okay? So, okay, I'm going to try it one more time. Scan, okay, now it's ready to roll background. And then you see number seven here. Number seven is execute. Hit number seven. Okay, it's not like your iPhone. You don't hit the screen. You have to hit the buttons below the screen. Okay, it just ran a background. I'm going to do it one more time because people forget how to do this. I'm going to hit scan, background, and then I'm hitting number seven, which is a multi-function key, which corresponds to this command up here that says execute. Execute. Okay, good. Now, we're running a spectrum of the air. Why do we care about the air? The air has a lot of water in it, and it has a lot of CO2 in it. We don't want water, we don't want water peaks and CO2 peaks to show up in our spectrum. Okay? Um, this will be continued on the next video.